Hi, I'm Ashish Patel. And my name is Fred Trotter. Uh, we are healthcare data journalists at CareSet. CareSet Journal is a healthcare data journalism organization that focuses on Medicare data. Uh, and then just to give you some context, we're going to be focusing on federal government data. Uh, there's a lot more information about this in an FAQ that ourselves, along with several different uh, academic and non-academic researchers who cover COVID, worked on together to help provide addendum and facts and treatment ideas on the information that the HHS and CDC are releasing today and other data sets that they've been releasing to help uh, understand the impacts of COVID. Uh, through this video, we're probably going to show some areas that appear to show appear to be kind of recovering or COVID is slowing down in its infection rate. This is not an excuse to have enormous parties. Please do continue to follow CDC recommendations. Take COVID incredibly seriously. We are social distancing. We are wearing our masks. We hope that you are continuing to do the same during any kind of gathering you're having. So let's take a look at the data. I, I think the right place to start here is uh, with actually not the slide with the, that has the first geoanalysis of the area of concern data, but with the area of concern algorithms. And so all of this, uh, and again, for background on all of this, the, this is part of the federal government's, um, you know, as they are planning and trying to distribute resources and really, res and really respond to the COVID crisis, they have to make decisions about who's going to get what resources. So they need to understand how things are changing, right? So if a, if a region of the country is having a special trouble, it might mean that a local school is not following a policy or a, you know, maybe local restaurants are not following a policy or something else. So when they see changes and they see shifts, that really matters because one of the most useful things that you can do with the federal coordination of this is that technically all this data is coming from the regions anyways, right? Tests are being done locally, the cases are local, all the data that's mixed in is sourced from local regions, but in many cases, they're not in a position to actually incorporate that and understand what it means. You have to put it together exactly in the right way in order to be able to see the patterns that might be concerning. And so one of the most significant ways that they do this is to come up with this kind of, for lack of a better word, epidemiological algebra, where they determine based on the number of cases that are happening right now and the number of cases that have happened previously, you know, how bad things are. And, and I just wanna highlight, um, I think, the, the kind of two sides, right? So if you look over here on the left, you see the low burden community and a moderate burden committee. And notice that those are not just having low uh, cases, it's having low cases and also not recently having had low cases, right? And then on the right, you see high burden resolving and moderate burden resolving. And that's actually like, hey, it could be, uh, there could be a lot of cases here, but it does look like they're going down. And you see inside, there's all of this logic about, well, there's less than 100 of this and less than 100 of this. All of this is in terms of cases and population rates and these kinds of things. And then in the middle, you have a hot spot. And then I think beneath that is a hot spot that's getting worse. An emerging hot spot is actually, um, I think in some senses, a real opportunity for the response. Because if you can interfere with an emerging hot spot, if you can say, well, they're not following rules or somebody's violating some protocol, or maybe there's something else that can be done, if you can stop a hot spot from becoming a hot spot, that could be a really big deal and save thousands and thousands. This is the kind of decisions that they're doing. Again, all of this is a kind of national triage of federal resources. The most famous federal resource that I think is, is decided upon for this data is the remdesivir data. It's probably the most important thing that I think has gotten the most discussion. But there's also the ability to send federal physicians in, there's the opportunity to coordinate other resources. There's an opportunity to just coordinate between two cities that are nearby and saying, hey, could you take some patients out of ICU rooms or could you take some, some patients that are not in ICU rooms so that we can, we can turn some other rooms into ICU rooms. All kinds of things that can be done uh, that are based on ultimately the federal government having a really good picture. And so that, what, we're, what we're seeing here is the algebra that they're actually using to make these decisions. Now, once we have these things uh, parameterized, if you could uh, give us the opportunity to scroll here for a second. We don't, we don't not show you the scrolling because it just makes you dizzy. But if you scroll back up to the maps that are, the, um, that, that are, are coded in terms of these things, and we'll turn the screen back on. So here's the first screen that's going to come up. Now, on this one, this is the actual scoring of the area of concern. And when you look at this map, you'll see the same thing you're seeing on all the other maps. And, and that is that, you know, we're in the middle of a surge and, you know, things are not great. And you're seeing the winter surge, like the fact that the map is almost all red is the winter surge occurring. 
And you'll also see how, you know, I think there was a time uh, when only New York was read and these kind of things at the beginning of the pandemic when New York was really suffering in a way that other, other less densely populated areas were not. Now you see that the pandemic really is truly nas nationwide. Um, and if you look at the bottom right, in fact, right behind Ashish, and Ashish, could you just lean for a second? Maybe you could look over there. Yeah, so <laughs> as you see Ashish leaning, um, that, that, that red is all of the areas that are currently in the hotspot status. And if you'll see, there's a little sliver above the red, and those are the places that are recovering. You can go back to that. You're, you're fine now. I am right in the middle. You're, you're right in the middle. It's just the, the way it goes. Sometimes spike. it happens. We're tr we tried to choose the most unimportant places for us to be in the in the data visualization, but sometimes it backfires. All right, so let's switch to the next. So uh, before we do, sure. I want to call out uh, back to that original epidemiological algorithm. There yeah. are two in the center: hotspot and sustained hotspot. And uh, there, there, there's kind of a threshold parameterization between the hotspot and, and sustained hotspot is around 100 cases per 100,000 versus 200 cases per 100,000. And then in the sustained hotspot, you've got 200, 200 cases per 100,000 over the last two weeks. And, and that's, that's really the key is that it's maintained new cases over a longer period of time. And at the time that we're recording this, 899 of the 900 some odd uh, geographic areas that are reported are in are considered sustained hotspots. So the graph that's all dark red right behind me is really the, showing that nearly 90% of the United States is a sustained hotspot. I'm going to yeah. So let's switch this slide. Okay. So now remember what I was saying that when there's these things that the federal government can do. Um, and again, I didn't give you any kind of formal list. I'm just kind of uh, hinting at the, what the possibilities are. But there are opportunities where things are changing. And so one of the things that they really care about is counties that are changing their conditions. So if you'll look at this chart, you'll see that there's a few green ones, there's a lot of red ones, and what they've done is they've grayed out almost all of the counties that are not changing. This is like a, who's, who has really had a shift recently? And the reason that they're gonna focus on that, right, is let's say that there is some problem with the school or something else happening, this might be the first signal that there's a, po a possibility. So this is almost a regional to-do list map for, for federal resources to get, yeah, we really need to pay attention to these particular counties. And you'll see that they're kind of a, it's kind of a mismatch. They're all over the place. They're the places that are really changing right now. So it's not like there's any kind of super obvious pattern. So areas like California, Arizona, Tennessee, Pennsylvania, Florida, Georgia, Mississippi, you see they're, they're really turning into rapid riser geographies. There is another data set that HHS released a few weeks ago that talks about hospital, hospital level COVID case count. So if we're putting ourselves in the position of public health policy folks or putting ourselves in the position of just a decision maker in a family, this information about whether or not your local community is turning into a sustained hotspot and there will be other information about the hospital on Main Street and whether or not they're 110% utilization on their ICU beds. These, this is the kind of information that the federal government can re release and release on a regular basis. The hospital data is updated on a weekly basis. This data is updated on a daily basis on the, on the trailing week. This is the kind of information that we really need to make smart choices, not at just at the public health policy level, but at the family, family rules level. And one of the things, I mean, emphasizing that discussion about you know, family discussions, um, one of the most important messages, as I think there's sometimes on the internet, people are saying, oh, it's not a big deal, or masks are not necessary, or all this kind of things. Remember that you absolutely have to follow the CDC recommendations. And of course, if you don't believe this is real, I think this is the thing that this shows you, is that this is real, and multiple data sources are confirming that. So it's a triangulation. In order to be able to show this, and one of the people working with is the COVID tracking project, who actually take all the state and city data and merge it together. And the pictures are not identical, right? There, there are small differences, but they are so much in line that it's very obvious that there is no fraud going on here. These red zones really are red zones, totally legitimate. So again, I think this is probably, we'll, we might do this in other videos as well, but good time to emphasize that you know, if you have choices like whether or not you absolutely have to travel, you know, do you really have to travel? Um, but you should always, no matter the circumstances, be following the rules that are invariant, social distancing, wearing masks, et cetera, et cetera. And again, visit the CDC for more information. I don't have anything else on this, do you? No, thank you very much for your time.